Hello and welcome to My Career in Data, a podcast where we discuss with industry leaders and experts how they have built their careers. I'm your host, Shannon Kemp, and today we're talking to Gwen Thomas, a data strategist at the Data Governance Institute. With a robust catalog of courses offered on demand and industry-leading live online sessions throughout the year, the Dataversity Training Center is your launchpad for career success. Browse the complete catalog at training.dataversity.net and use code DBTALKS for 20% off your purchase. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer at Dataversity and this is My Career in Data, a Dataversity Talks podcast dedicated to learning from those who have careers in data management, to understand how they got there and to be talking with people who help make those careers a little bit easier. To keep up to date in the latest in data management education, go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Today, we are joined by Gwen Thomas, a data strategist at the Data Governance Institute. And normally, this is where a podcast host would read a short bio of the guest. But in this podcast, your bio is what we're here to talk about. Gwen, hello and welcome. Hello, my friend. I was just, we were just talking about how we met for the very first time at Enterprise Data World 2011 in Chicago. That was my first data conference with Dataversity, and um, I, you were one of the first people I met. <laughs> I'm so honored. It's been such a joy to to chat with you over all these years, and I'm so excited to talk about how things have changed and evolved over those years too. And but uh, you know, hello, I'm so excited for you to be here. Oh, hello, and uh, I so enjoyed our our discussion about now. How far back did we meet? Um, And it was mostly a recital of of conferences and industry events, because frankly, the evolution of those events paralleled the evolution of my career. So, um, yeah, Yeah. you know, to all listeners, you can read books, you can read online, you can learn on the job, but there is absolutely nothing that compares to not only the classroom experience in conferences, but the conference within the conference, the mm-hmm. hallway talk, the discussions with those who have been there. So mm-hmm. I know you're not going to plug data diversity or uh, events, but consider that my plug for you <laughs> because that's what a career to me has looked like, learning from experts along the way. Oh, well, I so appreciate you saying that. And and it's true, the networking is my favorite part of the events is the networking. And, you know, and that's where we touch base every time is when you're speaking mm-hmm. and, and getting to know each other. And I've, again, had the privilege to see, you know, your the journey along the last 10 years. So um, let's, let's get into it. So okay, today, you are a data strategist at the Data Governance Institute. So tell me about the Data Governance Institute. So the Institute was formed uh, 20 years ago this fall, wow. or this summer, and um, it is an online presence. Most people know it by its URL, datagovernance.com, and it provides information on the uh, uh, discipline, the practices of data governance. It has an online uh, membership group and is a, we have heard from people at conference from people who who write into us that over the past 20 years our teachings and our trainings uh, have influenced um, data governance programs all around the world so it's um the institute kind of defies explanation on my part. <laughs> oh, I love that because uh, you know, and that's part. You know, we mentioned the networking, and that's part of what I love so much about this community is there's so much, um, so many people willing to help each other out. Sure, sure. So, and what many people don't know is you founded the Data Governance Institute. So. 
what prompted you to do that? And and what is your role in the in the company now? Okay, so I'm gonna answer that backwards. Okay. I, I just rejoined the company as an analyst and I have been um updating some content and providing some um online training on how to use the DGI's framework um yeah. to as you either create a program or join the program. The 10 years before that, I left the Institute in others capable hands while I spent 10 years with the World Bank Group. Mm -hmm. But now let's go back to its founding 20 years ago. And it's kind of tied to a question that you um, said you might ask uh, me about what was a big lesson I learned. Mm -hmm. Okay. So 20 years ago, I was five years into a career with consulting companies doing IT management, being a business analyst, um, uh, assisting coders, doing data management, et cetera. And the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002 was passed. And this act in the U.S. made it illegal for a CEO or a CFO to post incorrect financial reports about their company. Now, why it wasn't illegal before, I don't know. I mean, that's crazy, right? right. There's a whole history behind that and scandals. Uh, but the result was, the whole data, uh, whole IT industry, and um, mostly the accounting industry was just revolutionized. There were all of the efforts that had to be undertaken to ensure that your data was controlled against um, all the things that can go wrong with data. And I, on behalf of my my current employer, attended um, events on what what happens, and my mind was blown. Nobody was talking about the data, the data practices. Mm -hmm. They were talking about reporting. They weren't talking about the practices. They weren't talking about the human element of what goes into ensuring that data is what it's supposed to be. And so the lesson that I had sitting there in this room full of the big four accounting firms is, wait a minute, data management is about data and technology. The thing they're not talking about, data governance, that's about people. That is about people and you cannot be successful here if you are not addressing the people, the the ones who get together within a group and decide which other groups have powers to make decisions, mm -hmm. the people who actually make those decisions. And what happens if the, if the right people aren't in the room, which was the scenario I was in at that moment? What mm -hmm. happens if if the right people aren't making assignments about the right work that needs to be applied to the data, so the right controls are put in place, so that the data itself can be shaped and curated and structured so it actually meets your needs. So sitting in this happy, crappy little conference room <laughs> in a hotel in Texas, I said, wait a minute, publishing governs its data, a dentist stint in publishing, teaching administration has to organize all this content, there's nothing new there, marketing knows how to organized content. Here, these guys are talking about structured data, but please, where is the discipline? Where is the expertise about organizing, organizing, 
managing, making decisions about the content in these enterprise systems. So I went home from Texas to Florida, did my research, found nothing, 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 nothing. <laughs> As a matter of fact, a Google search for the term data governance showed 52 hits total. And 39 of them were IBM because they formed a little committee. So I said, folks, this is going to be the birth of an industry. And I bought datagovernance.com and I told my boss in six months, I'm leaving this bin joint. And that's, that's how it got started. Of course, there were a few other people around the globe and in the U.S. having similar thoughts. And um, we all ended up at those first conferences about this topic. <laughs> uh, so amazing. You were so forward thinking. And I am, you know, and I want to come back to data governance in a, in a bit. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, because I think that you and I could talk about that for, for hours. <laughs> we could probably do. We have in the past. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, um, you know, I wanted to, to drill in on the point where you talked about and you mentioned that data governance is about people. Yes, it, it is. It's so true. I mean, so pe so many people think it's, um, you know, even today and, and uh, people, so we get so many people asking for help. How do they talk their executives into doing data governance? Because their executives think it's a dirty word. It's think they think it's just about complying with laws and it's just about adhering to laws and it's a pain in the rear end and it's just something you have to do. And, but it's, it is, it's about the people and it's about so much more than, than adhering to um, the legal standards. And so I say what I've been saying for the last 20 years, if yeah. governance is a word in your organization, use a different one. Yeah. Use mm -hmm. a different word. The mm -hmm. work is the same. Likewise, for compliance. I recently coached a company that did not want to use the word compliance at all. So I mm -hmm. said, fine, commitments. What commitments has your organization made? Mm -hmm. What that your leaders have made to the industry, to their customers, to the board? Mm -hmm. How are you going to help them meet those commitments? Totally new spin on things, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. can you tell I did a little stint as an English speaker? <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll get to that for sure. <laughs> well, so what's the what's the uh, most creative you think um, uh, rewording of that that you've seen? Oh boy, um, I'm flubbing here. That's okay. uh, <laughs> I, I threw you, I know I threw you one for a little no, yeah. <laughs> I want to think. Um, well, there is, here's my answer. Yeah. So before there was a field called human factors that focuses on user interfaces, uh -huh. I knew a company that used that term, human factors, oh. to, to bring the human approach to the business of the business. And this human factors team, what consisted of what I would call family counselors, <laughs> and they call facilitators and negotiators and all of these human, uh, human resources terms. And they would cycle through the organization to, with the goal of working with leadership in different programs to understand how human nature and management training go into optimizing um, an organization. Sure. So oh, I love that. what's the difference between those disciplines and the people side of data governance? Not a whole lot. <laughs> Although they would probably had an extra zero at the end of their paychecks. <laughs> As it goes. 
<laughs> oh, that's funny. All right. Well, let's back it up here. Let's get into okay. some of your bio. So when, when you were just, you know, maybe five, six years old, was this the dream? You're like, oh, I'm going to grow up and I'm going to, and I'm going to start a data governance Institute and, and be a data strategist for them. Sweetheart, I didn't see a computer <laughs> until I was in my teenage years. So, of course not. I did want to be a librarian. Mm. And, of course, there's a big aspect of this. Uh, my father was a psychologist, so maybe that came into play. My mother was a writer, so maybe that came into play. But, no, I could not have envisioned <laughs> 2000, the year 2000, much less, much less 2023. Just right. like the people listening now really cannot envision what the world technology and information wise is going to be like 20, 30 years from now. They can, however, know what they love to do and find a way to discover things in which they can hopefully be happy doing what they do, regardless of how the world has changed around them. Yeah, I love that. So so tell me then, tell me about the journey. So what did you start studying and what did you, um, as you got into high school, and what, what evolved as your passion? So I, like many other people, became very passionate about something I was not skilled at. Hmm. I was a musician. I wanted to be a composer more than anything, a conductor. I went to college and learned that it was the architecture of music that I liked and that um, I had no skill whatsoever as a performer, none, and um, decided not to be a teacher. So I actually left all that behind mm -hmm. and went and did some other things. I, I told you I did a stint with a marketing organization where I discovered I'm pretty good at explaining how things work and, and what they do. I was a, a teacher for an uh, English teacher for a little while. And then I went into tech writing. It was only when I had an assignment working with a a data person who was trying to um, pull reports out of a database that had no documentation. They had no understanding of how the data was structured that I said, here, maybe this will help. I pulled out a piece of paper and I started creating on paper what I was later told was a data model. And then I said, based upon my knowledge of where the data is on the screens, it would make sense to organize it this way with these fields here and those fields there. And what do you call this thing? And the woman with a look on her face said, okay, very funny. You're a ringer, right? No, no. What do you call this thing? Um, a table? So another big light bulb moment, I said, oh. Can I make a living doing this? And would it be more than I'm making now my crappy little job? Yes and yes. Do I have to go to college? Uh, if you wait 10 years, you'll have to go to college in this mm -hmm. discipline. But if you slip in now, you won't have to. So uh, now when I look at data flowing through systems, now remember, it's everything's invisible that we do right. Everything is invisible. The data is invisible. The processes, the systems, the flows. But right. I'm right back in music school where I'm focusing on a melody and I'm watching that single note flow through the, the orchestra across the different pieces of the music. And I found my home. Oh, I love that story. I, I didn't know that. Um... You majored in music, and and that's the architecture of it. You're you're right. I mean, it, it's so relatable and so translatable. Mm -hmm. uh, and how so? Uh, 
so you you so then how did you start learning so you you've created a table just by accident <laughs> like so how did you start uh focusing on that and developing that as uh, a career what was your next step so at the time I was working in a bank uh -huh. uh, and I looked for a job where I could be paid as a lowly tech writer but in a software development environment and then I was surrounded with people to learn from, and it would be convenient to say, okay, so where do I go to learn about this little piece? And where do I go to learn about this little piece? And my superpower, Hannon, is I'm a dot connector. Mm -hmm. I, I am a synthesis, a word I didn't learn until I was in my 30s, as the guy <laughs> says. Um, but I can take a body of work from here and here and here and pull them together. And so that's, all right, here's a, to our listeners here. If you are early in your career and you're not sure what you're going to do, discover your passion, as I just talked about, and discover your superpower, the mm -hmm. thing that you are naturally good at that not everyone is, and the third. Mm -hmm. discover what you are interested in so much that you are willing to just dive in and spend hours mm -hmm. learning about it on your own. Now, put those three together. You have a profile of the type of work you want to do. I wanted to connect dots. I wanted to work with the human aspect of working with data. Mm -hmm. I naturally wanted to work in how everything fits together. Mm -hmm. I did I didn't want to be a nitpicker. I didn't want and that's why I did not go into QA or checking or anything. I I came into this other field. But all of you listening, if you're early in, in your career, if you know how to put those pieces together. The, what are you doing when you feel joy at work? The glow in jet. I guarantee there is a discipline within the field of data management and data governance that is a perfect fit for you. I guarantee you just find the part where your interests and your superpower and your perspective all come together and no matter how the technology changes around you you'll find your own career path oh such great advice Gwen and we have those conversations at data diversity all the time especially yeah. and when we're in process of growing you know we have those Ooh. conversations what part of your jobs do you love because you know we always have, have those little bits that you know you, you're not well the, yeah, you know, and you just got to take right. for the team. <laughs> but, you know, but what do you love? What do you, you know, what do you want to hand off? Because mm -hmm. you can find somebody and hire into, you know, find somebody who loves that job, that piece that you don't love. Right. Because we're so diverse, right? It is, you know, it's, it's okay to love different things and be good at different things and acknowledge that. And, and uh, I love that you um talk about so much and how curious you were and you asked a lot of questions you found mentors you found a place where you could learn and grow into what you wanted that's a, mm -hmm. that's awesome yeah mm -hmm. such a great conversation or such a great uh uh advice for people and so so from there Gwen so you so you've learned to code you, you're you're getting into technology so where do so, you yeah. I was, I never did a stint as a coder myself. Mm -hmm. However, working in a software environment, mm -hmm. I still dream in COBOL. I mean, that's <laughs> crazy, right? <laughs> but um, yeah. uh, I, I learned to read it well enough. And mm -hmm. then, um, no, I did a little bit of coding. I mm -hmm. built a metadata repository for a company that didn't have one. Wow. Um, but it was really just the prototype. I was using basic language mm -hmm. and 
I built something and then handed it to bosses and they said, that's great. And I said, it's not, it's not enterprise ready. I said, great, thanks. We'll take it from you and hand it to someone else. Ah. And that's another aspect of working in our field. You need to know yourself. Do I have to be the one that owns it? Mm -hmm. Do I have to have credit for launching something? Or are you good being a change agent, a prototyper, someone who gets it started? Or like in the last 10 years, I've been the guy behind the guy. I, I've i been the person sitting behind leadership, corralling up the information and perspective that they need so they could make um, decision. Mm -hmm. Some of the unhappy people I know weren't honest with themselves about which of those they want. Oh, and I left out that you just want to be clickety clackety doing the work. That's fine too. That's fine. But to be happy, you have to know this about yourself and slide into positions where the nature of the job meets your nature. And again, there's room for everything in data management. It is a microcosm of the whole friggin' world. <laughs> uh, I love that. You know, I wish I had learned that lesson so much earlier in life. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, ha I have the scar on my back from when I learned that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, we're we're taught so young that we have to be the best at everything, right? We have to win, and you know, and it's. It, I think especially in um, uh, not maybe so much in the younger gen, the gen millennials or Gen Zs, but but certainly older generations. But hey, um, as a boomer, yeah, I want to be the first to say the people in their twenties and early thirties now who are accused of being snowflakes no you go girl you, go, girl. <laughs> you know yourself you know what's right you know what's acceptable you know what's unacceptable and you're not afraid to state it go 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 do it i am with you all the way yeah right um again if we had that, <laughs> if i had that lesson at 20 <laughs> oh well <laughs> so different <laughs> Visit dataversity.net and expand your knowledge with thousands of articles and blogs written by industry experts, plus free live and on-demand webinars covering the complete data management spectrum. While you're there, subscribe to the weekly newsletter so you'll never miss a beat. But so, you know, um, so, okay, so, so, so where did you, so have you been in finance um, most of your career? You, you look sound, you started kind yeah. of in banking and... I, I have, and it wasn't because I love money. Mm -hmm. I'm act actually, you know, I talked about following the data. Mm -hmm. I work with hundreds of people who can follow the money through, mm -hmm. and, and I'm not interested. But in the early days of data governance, that's who was paying. So yeah. Yeah. And at a certain point, you gain so much expertise, it's kind of silly to walk away from it. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it has been, you know, the finance and the banking um, mm. uh, industry of the world and, you know, insurance, uh, healthcare, you know, that's kind of led that mm -hmm. there's so many, so much data and so much regulation, right, that they have to, right. that they have to deal with. So many commitments have been made. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, so, you know. Um, it kind of brings me around uh, to another question that you or something that you brought up at the beginning, um, you know, about data governance and it being a people um, oriented. Have you seen that change as it's evolved and as more industries do get into data governance? Um, have you seen it? Uh, um, it are there, as the tech changes, as everything else changes, uh, have you seen data governance change? So the reason data governance exists mm -hmm. is different in every organization. 
that's that's really important. I mean, if you're a small community college and you need data governance, it's probably best to keep track of your records and you know whatever. Yeah. On the other hand, if you're working in pharmaceuticals and you're trying to discover the next big thing, then your focus on insight, your focus upon um um discovery and your technology so i got two extremes here your technology is designed for different purposes you're going to have technology staff who have the right skills expertise and knowledge to work within that environment you're going to have data management team who can specialize with the same types of techno the right types of technology challenges and types of data that you're working with. And you're going to have data governance liaison facilitators who can work with data management in those areas. So yes, that part of data governance has always been changing, always will change. The the person who is has trouble answering, am I in data governance or data management? Likewise, leadership expectations are different in various environments. Mm -hmm. And today's leaders are expected to take a more human approach to leadership. So that aspect is the same. The piece in the middle of data governance between leadership and working with technicians and business people, the core concepts don't change. They really don't. People need to know how to work together. They need to know how to make decisions. We need to challenge whether the right people are making decisions using the right criteria. And, you know, this part doesn't really change, but because these are the dot connectors, the matchmaker people that, that work with so many people across the organization, the specific knowledge and skills. Yes, that has to evolve. How do you govern through agile? How does data governance change if your organization has put in place DevOps? How is data governance changing if now you have noticed that just like with Starbucks Oxley, the right people aren't in the room and suddenly Security thinks that access is being handled by the business, and business thinks access is being handled by security. By the way, I spent the last four years at the World Bank Group designing access governance. <laughs> so, yes, always the same, always changing. Makes sense. So, you know, with this in depth career in data, I mean, just uh, almost a founder of data governance, you know, what is your definition of data? <laughs> How many angels are happen to be dancing on that pin at this moment here? <laughs> okay. <laughs> it is it is whatever you need it to be. It's information captured electronically and being in finance most of my career has been working with basic structured data, but mm -hmm. in other fields, it is what you need it to be. <laughs> and it all needs to be governed and it all needs to be managed. Yeah, yeah, it's very, very true. So, and and do you see um, the importance of data management and the number of jobs working with data increasing or decreasing over the next 10 years and why? Uh -huh. Very interesting. Um, always important. Mm -hmm. The more successful we are in our work to standardize 
and mechanized. The more of our work goes into tools, mm -hmm. but also the higher our aspirations go. So my belief is the jobs will always be there. The focus, the expertise, the specialties will change. And some of them may no longer be full data management. Mm -hmm. I mean, data science, right? Data engineers. Mm -hmm. Put a new title on it and see, see what happens. Yeah, very much so. So um, any other advice that you would give to somebody who's brand new and looking to get into career? I mean, you've given some great advice already. Just, you know, there's so many different aspects, like you said, you know, you can find somewhere where you fit and, and find, I, I, based on what you're saying in terms of career possibilities, in terms of growth in the, in data management careers, it's pretty sustainable career, it sounds like. Yes, the, the sooner you can get into mm -hmm. a position where you are surrounded, where your work is acknowledged as a discipline, mm -hmm. then the easier your path will be. You know, I live in a city, you live in a city, it's easy to forget that half of the U.S., much less the world, um, live in areas where maybe there is not any place that needs a full-time data management person, maybe. And if if that's the case, then yeah, you're going to have to choose between a future career in a discipline in a city and being where you are and doing work that you are. That's probably a completely different topic from what you were asking. But what I will say is if you feel like you are in an environment where this kind of work can be done, pay attention as early as you can to who you are and what you want to be. And then be curious. Go in. You know, I found I found a whole concept that when I started playing Dungeons and Dragons at the ripe old age of 50, I said, what are these things called character seats? And why don't every human being have one? <laughs> if I had a character sheet for myself mm -hmm. at age 28, I would never have gone into that castle. I would have gone <laughs> on that side quest. <laughs> So sometimes maybe that's my advice to uh, people yes. early in their career. If you were a character in a game, how yeah. would you be configured? And what adventures would you go on? And mm -hmm. always carry a tail. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that advice. If so you get it, you get it. <laughs> yep, yep, I do. <laughs> I am not ashamed to admit I have been play <laughs> I played D and D for a very long time. <laughs> okay then. Oh <laughs> uh, well, Gwen, it has been such a pleasure as always to talk to you mm -hmm. again. I could talk to you for hours and hours, but um, I do want to keep the podcast here to to a reasonable time. But so, and I, I don't want to leave without giving you a chance to plug uh, the DGI and just you know. Again, datagovernance.com. I mean, that's so easy to remember, but we'll, of course, put that on the website, on the podcast okay. website and everything. But tell me a little bit, you know, about why and when people should reach out to you. Um, well, it's a good place to get started. Mm -hmm. It's full of evergreen content. Um, uh, you know, there are a whole new set of people working in the field who are not early in their career, but they have, they're doing a rotation through data governance or they have been assigned here. And 
the site is has been designed to um, be vendor neutral, mm -hmm. to not give advice that seems quite reasonable until you realize you're being corralled into using a specific tool. It's mm -hmm. very, very general. Um, and there are those who are members can can uh, deep dive into some materials, but I'm not here to to really pitch a a certain cap. As I said, it's more about learning how you work, and if the contents at datagovernance.com can help individuals as they enter the room and decide who to talk to and what libraries to study and what paths uh, appeal to them, then that would be great. Ah, I love it. Well, Gwen, it has been a pleasure as always. I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us today. And it's always wonderful to see you. Um, I will see you at the next conference. <laughs> yes. I'm so excited. Oh, EDW is in person again. And mm -hmm. I'm so excited. I can't wait to see the crew, uh, the, you know, and see everybody. So but right. although, even though we've seen each other at the last couple of data governance conferences. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I still live in Washington. So when you come for the December one there, um, let me show you some local haunts. Oh, I would love that, Gwen. I would love that a lot. So I will take you up on that. <laughs> Everyone, I hope uh, you enjoy this conversation as much as my friend and I have. And if uh, if any of this helps you um, find a path, then I'm a happy person. Oh, Gwen, thank you. Oh, that's amazing. Thank you. All right. And, and uh, thanks to all the people who are listening and. Uh, and if you'd like to keep up with the latest in data management and education, you may go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Until next time, and stay curious, people. Thank you for listening to Dataversity Talks, a podcast brought to you by Dataversity. Subscribe to our newsletter for podcast updates and information about our free educational webinars at dataversity.net forward slash subscribe.